How's everybody doing? Doing good? Yeah? yeah? All right. Thanks for being with us today. It's Labor Day weekend. That's awesome. And um, normally it's a low day for church, but looking at this service, I don't know. So anyway, we're glad you're hanging out with us today. Um, we, uh, we're concluding our series called No One Should Be Left Out Today. And uh, we don't, and I told this to the staff this past week and then again today, this morning, um, we don't take Sundays off or mail it in or dial it back just because it's a holiday weekend. As a matter of fact, I think the day's message is the best one of the whole series, and we've known that since it happened. So um, we're not going to give God anything but our best. We're going to come prepared and expecting God to move into work today, and he has in the first service. I got to pray with a couple of people after church was over with in a new around here room, and God is just moving in our lives, and it's just awesome to be a part of it. So um, I want to go ahead and, and push you. See, Wade, you know Wade. Wade was the guy up here just now. Um, talking about the offering and stuff. Wade's an awesome dude. Helps lead our middle school ministry and um, is one of my close friends. And so um, Wade's an awesome dude, but Wade's very nice. You know what I mean? You notice that? Wade's very nice to you. So I'm going to be mean to you for just a second, okay? Those cards in your seat, they look like this, right? If you don't have any, it's because you're sitting on them. And that means they're warm because your butt has warmed them up. All right, they are sitting here. I want all of them out of here, right? I want you to take these and invite somebody and, and, and they're, you know, that means that there's some on other seats that you have to get because we have pre we're prepared to fill them up again for next service. So um, all these do us no good sitting in the building. So there's a display in the lobby. There's some in your seats. How I don't have any rule following people in here. Like you, you point them out if you're a rule follower. Are you married to a rule follower? There's one, two, three. All right, so awesome. At least those of you that are rule followers, let me set the rule for you. You cannot leave today, right, without taking all the cards out of the seats. So hopefully the five of you that are rule followers just got like, crap, man, i got to get all these cards out of the seat. Yes, you have to grab them all because you're a rule follower. Um, and so grab them all, um, invite somebody next weekend. And look, here's, here's what we know. We've been writing down names on walls for, for weeks now. You can do that today, by the way. There's Sharpies along the walls. Feel free to write a name on the wall. Whatever you want to do, do it after church is over with. Do it in the middle of me speaking. Whatever God moves you to do. Um, there's over 3,000 of them that we know of before last week. We didn't even count this past week. Over 3,000 of them written on the walls in a matter of four weeks. Um, and what we know is, is that we pair that up with us praying over them and God moving in their lives um, with a card. And then what's going to happen is God's going to move, and they're going to show up next Sunday. And we don't even care if they don't show up here. Right? That's not the goal. The goal is not to fill up Union Church next weekend. The goal is to share the gospel wherever it is they show up to hear it. So we will pray over and be prepared for what God will do here, but we'll also pray over every church around us, even if they don't like us, because there's some that don't, and pray for them that God will move there. And hopefully what will happen is, is they'll wake up Sunday morning, September 11th, and then they will, um, they'll go, what the crap happened? Our church is full. And we'll go, ha, our God did that. So um, it'll be awesome. So take these as you leave today. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts 19. Acts 19, we were there. Um, so, so for this series, let me recap just a little bit. We've been in Acts 18 for three weeks. Took us three weeks to do one chapter. I know I'm slow. And then we did Acts 19, the beginning, 1 through 10 last week. And we're going to do 11 through 20 this week. And then you're going to be on your own for the rest of it. I actually might switch up next week's message. Um, it'll, we'll still get past your past, don't worry. But we may end up preaching on the rest of Acts 19 um, next week as well. I just hadn't figured it out yet. God's kind of leading me in that way, and I'm, right now I'm pushing back on him, you know, because I want to go with what I got planned, but he is going to win ultimately. So um, anyway, we're going to be in Acts 19, the middle of the chapter, 11 through 20. Um, go ahead and crack out your paper Bible if you got it. Turn your Bible on. If you, have to, if you have an electronic Bible on your phone, if you don't have a Bible, we will give you one on the way out. So just stop by the info desk and ask them for one, and they'll hand you one. And also, you can follow along with me on the screens. And so when we get into this, this is some of the coolest scripture that I know of. Um, it's, it's, I love this passage, and mainly because it's got nudity and violence in it. Right? All the men were like, nudity? Did he say, am I in the right church? Yes, you heard it right. And all you young people are like, I don't want to read the Bible. It's boring. Look, it ain't. Nudity and violence. Now stay away from Leviticus because you're going to start reading about menstrual cycles. But um, <laughs> nudity and violence, we're going to read it today. Okay, it's awesome. And so what we're looking at is this church plant in Ephesus. And so what we followed for the last four weeks is Paul and then different people, Apollos, Aquila, Priscilla, Elvis, whoever. But anyway, we followed them for the last few weeks and we've watched what they've done through the church plants. And then all of a sudden last week we noticed that, that Paul sends him to Ephesus, I mean that God sends Paul to Ephesus, right? And so we're seeing the church plant in Ephesus. Now this church is amazing, right? I mean it's absolutely amazing, right? I mean it's a, it, like we think we're cool because we transformed a stinky YMCA. They transformed the whole city, right? 
I think I got pretty good staff, but my staff are horrible compared to the staff that this church has. I'm serious, including me. Um, Paul is the church planner, the greatest Christian disciple that has walked earth so far, um, in which there could be a better one, by the way, you could be. In. Anyway, um, Paul is the church planner. He starts the church, right? I started this church. I'm no Paul. Um, uh, pastor of the church is Timothy. When you get two books of the Bible written to you and named after you, First and Second Timothy, you're doing something. I ain't got nothing nowhere close to it. I got Adam. My name's Adam. I basically got the first sinner. You know what I mean? That's me. <laughs> Adam means man of red clay. So I guess my name means man of red neck. You know? <laughs> I got that joke from Wade this morning. See? He's not always corny. He's pretty good sometimes. He texted it to me after the first service. Um, <laughs> But that's all I got. But Timothy is the pastor. And then, I mean, we have an awesome board of advisors, elders, whatever you want to call it. We call it an advisory team. Um, <clears throat> we've got an awesome board of them. But, but John, the disciple John, is one of their elders. You know, the one that wrote John 3, 16, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's John, right? He is one of their elders. So it's a kick-butt church. They are on focus. They are on, they are on mission. They are following Jesus. They are, people are getting saved in this town. They're transforming the whole city. But the crazy thing is, is that in Revelation, we're going to talk about this week, so if you want to read it later, go read it. In Revelation, the last book in your Bible, Jesus actually scolds this church for getting away from what we're going to read. So when you see it in Revelation, when he, when he pushes back on them that they've gotten away from their first love and that they're not doing those things, he's talking about the things that we're going to talk about today, what they were actually started off doing, what they began doing, really the beginning of the church today. And they do about five things that we're going to focus on today as we get to it that will keep us from having a Christless, Christless Christianity. That's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. So let's go ahead and um, dive into Acts 19. Let's start off with... Verse 11, um, that's where we're going to go first. Hey, let me throw these down here so my rule followers still have to pick those up too. There we go. Whoops, sorry. Anyway, Deborah, that's you. You're a rule follower. Pick them up. Anyway, so um, let's start off with verse 11. <clears throat> we'll see. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. First verse, verse 11. This is the whole verse. We tend to read the Bible and skip past verses like this. Um, you know, we tend to open up our Bibles and get our Bible study plan, get our Bible app study for the day or whatever, and we roll past these verses, you know, and then we check off, we read our Bible for five minutes, whatever. But we don't want to miss verses like this um, because it's really, really crucial. So it says God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Now, the extraordinary word there means like one of a kind, right? And so if you know anything about Paul, you'll know he's done some pretty cool stuff. But what happens in Ephesus through this church is the coolest stuff that he's ever been a part of, right? Literally. And God does extraordinary miracles. Now, what's the subject, or who is the subject of this sentence, of this verse? Pull it back up there. They need help. Who's the subject of this sentence? God. God's the subject of the sentence. Paul's not the subject of the sentence. Who does extraordinary miracles? God does, not Paul, right? It says he does them through Paul. He could do them through a tree, too. That does not make Paul special, right? God does extraordinary miracles. He is the subject of the sentence. He is the initiator and the activator, and I ain't talking about Jerry Curls, okay? Initiator and activator. He initiates the miracles, and he activates them. God does that, not Paul, not us. He does. See, Paul's not doing them. Paul's not initiating. Paul's not activating. The church is not doing them. The church is not initiating the miracles, and the church is not activating the miracles. God is. He is the subject of our sentence. You know that? He's the subject of our sentence. Nine people accepted Christ last week at Union Church. Nine people. You should clap. You're clapping for God. Nine people made to switch over from heaven to hell. Nine people have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside their soul. They probably don't know what the heck to do with it yet. I ain't figured it out completely either, but it's there. Nine. But we didn't do it. I didn't do it. Uh, you didn't do it. The church didn't do it. Stinky YMCA didn't do it. God is the subject of our sentence. God did it, not us. Don't ever miss a verse like this. God is the subject of our sentence. Is he the subject of your sentence? Or are you living a life where you're the subject of your own sentence every day? 
Here's what's going to happen tomorrow. You're going to have a challenge first thing Monday morning, right? Oh, maybe not this week because it's Labor Day. Some of you have off, right? How many of you don't like the people that have off Monday? Raise your hand. There you go. Point at them and be like, don't, don't complain, all right? Like most of you are off Monday, and so when you go back Tuesday, you're going to have a tendency to all of a sudden make you the, the subject of your sentence again. I got to go to work. I got to pay bills. I got to take care of these crazy kids. You know, I got to wipe the runny noses. I got to, I got to buy groceries. I got to do this. I, you know, like you're going to make this yourself the subject of your sentence again. So don't miss out on this first verse. God is the subject of the sentence always. If there's going to be anything miraculous happen in your life or mine or in the church's life or any of the people's names written on the wall, it's going to be God doing it, not us. All right. How many times do I have to tell you I have no clue what I'm doing as the pastor of your church? None. All right. If that makes you uncomfortable, I am too. So we're uncomfortable together. All right. Most of the time I'm scared out of my pants all the time. You know what I mean? Um, I'm just, I just am constantly. Um, let's look at verse 12. So God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him, had touched Paul, were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Okay, they are healing people by accident, right? Literally, a snot rag is healing people, okay? This is where you get the term holy snot from, okay? Right here. Straight about, I mean, no, no kidding. Like, miracles are happening by accident. You know, Paul's going, I got a cold, throwing it over there, and Grandma's getting up. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. It, it's, it's a whole nother level. And when I tell you that, that, Paul does, that God does extraordinary things through Paul in verse 11, you have, you have to understand that Paul has seen and done all, read, read all of his stuff. I mean, he wrote almost half of the New Testament, okay? Read it all. There's been some extraordinary things happen, but ain't nothing happened like it's been happening at Ephesus. Nothing. And this, though, is the church that ends up getting off track at some point. And instead of being known for God doing extraordinary miracles, one-of-a-kind things, literally through snot rags that they don't even mean to, people getting accidentally healed, they end up being known by stews and potlucks. Instead of omission for God, they get off track, if you read in Revelation later on today. And so what I want to make sure that we do is we follow in what the early church in Ephesus did, and we don't turn into the older church in Ephesus. Does that make sense? But, but there, I mean, can you, can you just agree with me that this is a whole different level? I mean, snot rags? accidentally healing people like we believe in healing um if you've ever asked yourself if we're that kind of church well sure we are you can't believe that jesus came down here died for your sins rose from the grave conquered death ascended back into heaven sent the holy spirit back out to hang with you and not think that he can't heal sicknesses can't do it right the Jesus of the New Testament healed sicknesses, and then his people healed sicknesses, and through the Holy Spirit, we can as well, and if that makes you feel uncomfortable, don't worry, it makes me feel crazy too. So we believe in healing, and we've had people heal. There's a, there's a lady who has a wonderful testimony, she'll be here next service, she'll sit right here on my row, nobody ever sits with me, so I love the fact that she sits with me, because nobody ever sits on the front row. You see this? Look, one time I put $5 bills on all the front rows, for that week they were full. And, and our $5 offerings didn't increase. Hmm. 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 Anyway, and she sits with me, and she, she was healed here in this building first Sunday, right? And she'll tell you, healed, straight up healed. And then there's been some times where I prayed for people, and I don't think they got healed. You know what I mean? But I definitely ain't never snotted on something and nobody got healed. You know what I'm saying? It ain't never happened. This is a whole different level. Look at verse 13 and 14. Some Jews who ran around driving out evil spirits tried to, tried to, looks at it, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, not, not in, in the name of Jesus that saved me, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Verse 14, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. These guys are about to be forever known as the seven sons of Sceva, not because of something good. Have you ever been known? Be like, oh, you Larry Cook's son. I've gotten that all my life. You know what I'm saying? All my life I've gotten that. You ever got that? You ever known by something like, like nobody's ever going to forget that that's you, and you're like, yeah, that was me. And, you know, seven sons of Sceva always. And later on, I'm going to show you how to use this verse if you get mad at somebody, how to use seven sons of Sceva. But basically, I mean, wh what are they doing? They're, they're going around using the name of Christ, referencing the Christ that Paul does, kind of coattailing, coat right, piggybacking, 
what's going on through the ministry of Paul and the church in Ephesus and trying to heal people and remove demons and those kind of stuff. And in their claim, they're even saying in their thing, like, you know, that Jesus, right? And they're, they're the seven sons of Sceva. Basically, what they're doing is, and I think a lot of us do this a lot, they want the blessing without knowing the blesser. That's what they're doing. They, they want the gift without knowing the giver. There have been times in your life, there have been in mine, if that frees you up a little bit, where I've wanted the blessing without spending time with the blesser. That I've wanted the gift without putting in the sacrifice of hanging out with and modeling my life after the giver. And that's basically what they are doing here. You can't get the blessing without a relationship with the blesser. You may think you are for a while, but you're not getting the blessing. You can't get the gift without having a relationship with the giver. It's just how it works. Look at verse 15, one of the coolest verses in the Bible, followed by the most awesome one, verse 16. But let's look at verse 15. One day the evil spirit answered these dudes. It says these dudes in my Bible. Does it say that in y'all? Yeah. These dudes. Jesus, I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? I love this verse. I love it, right? The, the, the demon basically goes, hey, look, I know Jesus, and I've heard about Paul, but who do you think you are? There's almost a who the blank are you verse right here. Do you see it? It's almost that. It's, it, anybody a smart Alec? I'm calling you a nice word. I should be calling you a smart donkey. Anybody? Yeah? I am too. It's okay. And I think that we're really smart people because we're smart Alecs. But anyway, so um, uh, uh, look, this is, like a, this is like a smart Alec verse right here. He goes, um, I know Jesus, and I've heard of Paul. Then he looks him up and down, you know, find somebody to look up and down. Bam, right there. Who are you? Right? I don't know you. I don't know who you are. Look, do you know that the most theologically accurate, the most theologically accurate people in the Bible, or beings in the Bible, or whatever word you want to call it, the most theological accurate, you know who they are? They're not the religious. They're not the pastors. They're not the church people. They're not the deacons. They're not the elders. They're none of that mess. They're the demons. The demons are the most theologically. Read your Bible. Every time you see a demon, they are theologically accurate. They know who Jesus is, they know where he came from, and they know that he wins and they lose. They know it. They say it constantly. Look through your Bible. Everywhere you see it, the demons know what's up, right? They know Jesus. They know who Jesus is. They know who he is, where he came from, and they know that he wins. They know Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? There's a, there's a way to know and there's a way not to know. Sometimes we would say this is the know about but don't know. But let me, let me give it to you another way. When the Bible says the word know, it means intimate. Like, for example, the first time you see the word know in the Bible, um, Adam, uh, 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 God makes Eve for Adam. Remember last week I said, you, if some of you were here and some of you weren't, this is going to make some of you that weren't here feel weird. But last week he makes, he makes Eve, and, and, and then Adam looks at Eve and goes, uh, mine, and then he goes, mine. You know what I'm saying? And then anyway, yeah, Valerie told me not to do it again, so I was going to do it again. Um, <laughs> so I'm a good husband. Anyway, some of, you, some of you will never come back. And that's cool. It opens up seats when you decide to do that. But anyway, um, he, he, Adam knew Eve. It says Adam met Eve, God created Eve, and then Adam knew Eve. He knew her. I don't need to tell you what that means, though. And see, they know Jesus, but they don't know him. Do, you know about Jesus, but do you know him? Right? But see, here, here's not the only thing. They knew Jesus, but then they say, we've heard about Paul. I love this. They're like, we heard about Paul. Yeah, my cousin Jerry got cast out the other day by a snot rag that fell down. You know, we know, we know about Paul. Like, I, I love this. I, I, want to, I want to be this. I want them to know about me. I, I want the demons to say, we know who Jesus is, and we've heard of that redneck from Caswell County. Well, you know what I mean? Like, I want them to know about us as a church. How cool is that if that's the case, that the demons know who we are. They have heard about us. Like, I, I would, all, I, this is going to make me sound arrogant and cocky, and if, if you don't know me, you think I am that already, um, but if you know me, you'll know that that's the exact opposite of who I am, um, but I'm going I'm to have an arrogant moment, if that's okay with you. Um, I think he knows who I am, like it knows about me, you know, I don't think he knows me like he knows Jesus, but I think that the demons know about me. I think they do. I think that's why they try to come out to my family every single Saturday. 
I think that's, that's just the case. I think they know about me. But I want to ask you a question. Do they know about you? Like, are you making an impact in the kingdom enough? Not that you're doing, you know, holy snot rags. I'm not talking about that, okay? But do they know about you? Or would the demon say to you the third thing he says, which is, who are you? They don't, they don't know these guys. Why don't they know them? Because they're not really operating in the vein of who Jesus is. They're not making any difference or impact in the kingdom whatsoever. They know Jesus. They've heard about Paul. Pray that's us, man. I just pray that that's the case, that somebody's like, that there's some demons rolling around going, yeah, that's that redneck's church. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, I'll take that any day. But who are you? I don't ever want to be in that category. Now, here's the coolest verse in, in all of this that we're going to read. And if you're waiting for the nudity and the violence, wake up. Here it comes. <laughs> verse 16. Then the man who had the evil spirits jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked, not naked, naked and bleeding. Now look, 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 let me just, let me just say, this is a cool, that's a cool verse. Look, I'm telling you, if you're young and you don't like the Bible, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's got some cool stuff in it, right? Stuff that your mama won't let you read in magazines or online, it's in here, okay? Um, look, I, I may, okay, so... You're not, I'm not going to, I'm going to have a hard time admitting this to and being your pastor, and you, some of you may not want me to be your pastor anymore, but that's cool. Um, I have been in quite a few fights, like more than I would like to admit as your pastor, and more than you're probably comfortable with me being your pastor and saying that I've been in fights. But I have been. Um, I have won, and I have lost. You know what I'm saying? I have won, and I have lost. Um, and that's just how it is. Never once have I been hit so hard or hit someone else so hard that their pants fell off. That's a beat. Like, that's a whooping. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no denying who won. Like, I love MMA. How many love MMA? You can still be Christians and love people beating on each other. It's a sport. Anyway, I love it. We love to watch it all the time. Me and Aiden watch it. It's cool. Valerie and the, and the girls don't get it, but it's all right. You know, and, and I love to watch it. But let me tell you about MMA. Almost all the time, there is a clear winner and a clear loser. Okay? Rarely does it go to a decision where you're like, oh, I don't know who won. Because most of the time what happens, the loser is asleep and the winner is standing up, okay? Clear winner. There's no denying right here in this scripture. When you knock a dude's pants off, when you hit them so hard that their britches fall off, I would say that you win, right? Wouldn't you say that that's the case? I mean, you get punched so hard your pants fall off? That's a bad day, man. Now you see why they know them as the sons of Sceva forever, right? If anybody ever makes you mad, right, and you just want to whoop them, be like, look, I'm about to give you some sons of Sceva, right? They're not going to know what you, what you say and are talking about. They're going to be a little taken back. Sons of who? Right? <laughs> that means you're going to beat the pants off of them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but look, all seriousness, without Jesus, um, that's you. You're just playing church. Without Jesus, you're just playing church. And there's a lot of Christless Christians who are just playing church and there's some in our church and there's some sitting here and you're sitting real still right now because you don't want anybody to see you react to what I'm saying without Jesus you're just playing church and see what happens is, is is when you operate in the name of Jesus without the power of Christ you will end up it will leave you embarrassed and wounded I didn't say I didn't say on that I didn't say naked and bleeding did I embarrassed and wounded. If you operate in the name of Jesus without the power of Christ, you will end up wounded and embarrassed, guaranteed. Because you are fighting something that you don't have the weapons to fight. And you'll lose every time. It'll be a clear MMA match. You'll be laying on the ground with your pants off and the demons up here going, woohoo! Every single time. See, the problem is not a technique. We tend to think that the problems in our lives are all technique. Let me switch up my style, right? No, nobody care about your style. Your style sucks anyway, okay? I mean, look at me. Do you know what style I have? T-shirts and jeans, okay? It, one, for one nanosecond in history, that was popular. You know, it's not anymore. It's not about technique. It's about heart and soul, all right? It's not about technique. It's about heart and soul. Like, for example, your marriage is not the technique of your marriage, okay? You cannot submit to an imperfect spouse when you can't even submit to a perfect Jesus. 
because they're imperfect. Believe me, men, you're imperfect. I know because I am one. I am an imperfect husband. And she cannot submit to me as her husband if she has not submitted to a perfect Jesus. It'll never happen. Your marriage doesn't need a technique change. It needs a heart and soul change. It needs a gospel change. Operating with Jesus outside of your marriage will eventually make you wounded and embarrassed. Some of you know that because you lived it. 60% of people in the room did. See, if you really get the gospel, when you, when you really get the gospel, you'll understand how horrible you were and how he pursued you in spite of you and did whatever it took to save you and to love you. And that's how you love your spouse. That in spite of you and in your imperfectness, I will pursue you and I will love you regardless because I've submitted to a perfect Savior. Therefore, I can submit, mutually submit to you who is imperfect. You don't need a technique change. You don't need a self-help book. You need a heart and a soul change. If it's the same way with your finances, you know, like, we're going to tell you, you know, to take a Dave Ramsey class, and you can take all the Dave Ramsey classes if you want to. Matter of fact, we're going to start talking about it until you next week. we got one coming up here in the fall, Financial Peace University. It had changed my marriage. The vast majority of the people in the room need to take it but won't because you're too scared to admit that you're in the 80 85% of the people in the room who are drowning in debt. And when I mean drowning, I mean drowning. Like, every day it's like, <gasps> okay? But you won't admit it and stay real still right now because somebody will know that I just got you. So don't move. Look straight ahead. That's what you do in church when he gets you. Like, oh, crap. If I move my head right now, somebody's going to know that I'm drowning in debt. They probably know it anyway. Because your car is too expensive and your house is too expensive and you don't make enough money. Okay? But you don't need a Dave Ramsey class. I mean, that will help. Take it. But if you do that class without Jesus, you'll fail. It's not a technique. It's a heart and soul issue. Same thing if you've got a self-esteem problem. So many of us have self-esteem problems. I do too. Self-esteem problem. Well, the problem is, is you don't need to change the technique up. Like, you don't need to go get something injected in your face to get rid of the wrinkles. Please quit doing that, by the way. It's weird, okay? <laughs> Faces are meant to move. You know what I mean? When they don't move at all, like, we're just like, I'm going to smack you. I'm going to sons of skiva you. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's wrong? What's wrong with your face? Anyway, you, you, you realize that this not, it's not a technique issue that you need to change. It's the, the, the bottom line is, is that you need a heart and soul issue. Like, you don't know what Christ values you at. You don't know that he's in love with your face, just like it is. You don't know that he spent everything on you. I want to show you five things I talked about earlier as we move on with the message, and I ain't doing real good on time. Five things um, that the early Ephesus church did to not have a Christless church through the next few verses. Um, and then this is what they don't do later. But this is what they start off doing. Look at verse 17. When this became known, what became known? That the sons of Sceva got their tails whooped. To the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. Not bad fear, good fear. Reverent fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. So if you want to keep from becoming a Christless Christian, or we want to become, stop becoming a Christless church over time, the first thing we do is we worship Jesus. That's what you see them doing in this verse. They worship Jesus. It says that, they, that the name of Jesus was held in high honor. Worship is a very serious thing. You know those crazy people beside you who scream out stuff, and they're kind of moving around a little bit, and you think they're crazy? Well, they just really believe this thing. Like, they're really into the fact that Jesus saved them. Right? When you look over here and you see me with my hands up doing these loser ales, okay, that's what I do. You see my, my cow legs hanging up here, you know, with the <laughs> stuff jiggling, and I hold up the L, you know, and that's why, because I really believe that he saved me and I want to sing to him about it, right? And if you don't like the way I sing, tough luck, you know what I mean? Like, and then guess what somebody told me today after church was over with? Somebody said, Adam, Adam, it doesn't mean you're a loser. That's what love is in sign language. And I was like, oh God, thank you. I'm not a loser. You love me. How cool is that? I guess I was speaking in tongues. Get it? Get it? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's true. And so, um, I mean, I'm just saying, like, worship is that how it is. Look, you, when you walk into worship, you walk into an intimate environment. We set up everything else for you to feel good, right? You come in, and people greet you, and they say hello, and if they don't, we'll fire them. 
All right, in a heartbeat, ask somebody. They've been fired. And then they come in, and you get coffee, and you get cookies and all that stuff, and then you come in, and you can kind of sit where you want. Everybody kind of chill, you know, and we want you to check your kid in, but we ain't really made you yet, but it's coming. And so, you know, we do all those kind of things, you know. And then when you get to the worship portion of it, though, it, it gets a little weird because you just walked into an intimate environment. And I can't take the intimacy away from it. It is what it is. If you want to keep from becoming a Christless Christian, you worship Jesus. See, we hold that name in high honor. And that's what that verse says. We hold that name in the highest honor that there can be. This is a safe place for you to hear the most dangerous message in the world. We hold that name in high honor. And see, worship, worship fuels your heart to grow in Christ. Did you know that the Bible tells you to raise your hands in worship? It tells you to. So, those of you that don't do it, I wouldn't call you sinning, but you're close to it. Mm, that'll preach. Look at the next part of verse 18, just the first part. Many of those who believe now came. See, number two is we come together in fellowship. We come together in fellowship. They came together. So we worship Jesus, and we won't become Christ as Christians. And then we come together in fellowship, and that's what they do here. There's no, 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 there's no Lone Ranger Christians. Do you know that? A, no, a Lone Ranger Christian is not really a Christian. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. Everybody seen Lone Ranger and Tonto, right? There's no Lone Ranger Christians. I want, I want to tell you a um, little illustration. Like, you may have heard of this before. It's called the Foot Christian, the Dead Foot Christian. I don't know if some of you heard this. I didn't write it, but it's really cool. The dead foot Christian. If you go out to church today, you know, you leave church. Oh, it was awesome, you know, and then you go out. And God stepped on, Adam stepped on my toes. God kind of moved, but I don't know if I'm going to do anything about it yet. But I'm going to get Mexican. And then you walk out of church, you go to your car, and hopefully you're parked a long ways away unless you're a visitor. And you go to your car and you open up the door, and right beside your car is a foot. Like a foot. Like bloody. Like got cut off. A foot. You know? And you're like, there's a foot beside my car. Like there's a dead foot. There's a foot here. Nobody's going to look at that foot and go, silly foot. Must not like organized bodies. <laughs> no, you're not going to act like that. You're going to go, holy crap, there's a foot. Help, there's a foot. Something happened. There's a dead foot here. It's dying. It's a foot. And then you know you're going to be like, oh, God, it's a foot. You, you kind of want to pick it up, but then you kind of don't because it's a foot. You know what I mean? Even if it won't cut off it's still a foot and you kind of you kind of don't want to pick it up but you kind of do right and then all of a sudden it hits you you're like hold up there's a body without a foot somewhere there's some dude giving it around looking for his foot what happened what happened you're gonna flip out you're gonna flip out because what happens to that foot as it sits on that concrete or that asphalt out in that parking lot it's gonna stink it's gonna shrivel and it's gonna die guaranteed and then the body that it's missing from is going to hurt and it's possible the body also begins to stink shrivel and die Christians detached from the body will stink shrivel and die every time you got to come together in fellowship and see what happens is is that Christian who's detached from the body stinks shrivels and dries dies but also does the body suffer from it the church is walking around going well what happened to that foot we'll have to get along with one for a while come together in fellowship look at the next part of 18 many of those people who believe now came and openly confessed what they had done so not only did they worship Jesus, not only did they come together in fellowship, but they confess and they repent. Look, let me tell you something. It's okay. We believe this is a church. It's okay not to be okay. It's not okay to stay that way. It's okay for you not to be okay. But it's not okay for you to stay that way. Love doesn't leave people that way. Love loves them and tells them it's okay for you not to be okay, but I'm not going to leave you that way. You've got to confess and repent. Look, we've got to wage war on the sin that's in our lives. Notice I didn't say we need to wage war as a church on other people's sin. Churches that are doing that are wrong. They will be held accountable. But we have to wage war on the sin that's in our lives. We gotta wage war on it. I mean, call out all the troops. Call out all the big guns and the big dogs. We gotta wage war on the sins that's in our lives. And you know what? Confession and repentance, but specifically repentance, is your nuclear weapon. 
to crush it and end it. It's your nuclear weapon. Repentance. God, I am wrong. I have sinned against you. I do not want to follow that anymore. I want to follow you. I'm going to turn away from it and point to you instead of to it. And you've just dropped a bomb, a nuclear bomb on the sin that's in your life. Aiden and I like to watch not only MMA, we like to watch When Animals Attack all the time. You know that show? When Animals Attack. You know what I'm talking about? We love it. Animals, you know, the animals that attack those people almost all the time, they're animals that they tried to tame. They're wild animals that they tried to tame. You ever seen that? And one day we're watching it, and this bear, Fluffy, this humongous grizzly bear, and this little blonde chick, and she's over there getting it to do tricks, and all of a sudden, Fluffy eats the face off of the blonde chick. And my son says, Daddy, why would anybody have a bear as a pet? And I said, you're right, son. Because eventually that apex alpha predator is going to do what it does. It's going to devour. It's going to eat. That's what it does, right? And let me tell you something, guys. And hear me when I say this. And I don't care how long we're taking, okay? I don't care. You cannot domesticate the sin in your life. You can't domesticate it. You either repent or it'll eat your face off. There's no other way around it. You can't make it a part of the family. It can't hang out and eat dinner with you. Eventually, Fluffy is going to turn into what Fluffy does, and sin is going to turn into what sin does, and it's going to eat your face off. You can't domesticate it. I know from personal experience, I don't preach to you from theory. I preach to you from the Bible, the Word of God, and how He has shown me this in my life. There are multiple things that I've tried to domesticate in my life, and eventually it ate my face off. And most of the time it eats the family that's hanging out with the person too. Look at verse 19. A number who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas, or uh, a silver coin that's basically worth a day's wages. 50,000 days' wages. Seven, eight million dollars. So what you see them do, not to become Christless Christians, is you see them give sacrificially. And look you think that I'm saying this right now for money, you, you're missing the point of the scripture. They burned up what was worth that much. They gave sacrificially. Jesus says the number one competitor for your hearts is the love of money. And so what they did was is that they realized that they had been gathering possessions for themselves and those possessions were sitting on the throne that Jesus is supposed to sit on. So they took them off and burned them. You and I have got to do the same thing. I told Dylan I was going to get you guys with this this week. Is this good? Get ready. God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. Gave. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God, get, God loved the world so much that he gave. He gave, you keep. That doesn't add up. It never will. It doesn't add up give sacrificially last one verse 20 in this way the word of the Lord spread wild, widely and grew in power spread widely and grew in power every time all, all this whole series every time we've got to a conclusion verse it's been that the word of the Lord spread that there's a people in this city that, that everybody in Asia heard Jesus heard about Jesus like the word spread and what's happening is, is for them is that if we want to be not a Christless church so we, we worship Jesus we come together in fellowship we confess and repent we give sacrificially and then lastly we stay rooted in the word we stay rooted in the word do you know what it means to be rooted in the word it means when things come and shake you go back to the root the root holds on and to do that we have to be rooted in the word you know what I mean? So for example, if you're saying, if it comes up to you and your self-esteem sucks and you don't like who you are anymore, you go, hold up, I'm rooted in the Word. And Psalms tells me that I'm fearfully, wonderfully made, so I'm rooted in the Word. And then you get to trouble in your marriage and your marriage starts to stink and it starts to smell like that broken foot and you go, hold up, hold up, I'm going to be rooted in the Word right now. And even though the world wants to tell me this, the Word says to me in Ephesians to mutually submit to one another. 
and that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold tight in the fact that my job is to give up my life like Christ gave up his life for the church to my wife. And then my job is to respect my husband and submit to him as he gives his life for me. Like you're going to root back to it. That's rooting to the word. When you get to your finance part and you're overwhelmed by it, you're going to root back to the fact that there is no debt Jesus didn't pay to crush and he did not save you for you to be in debt to somebody else. Stay rooted in the word. Look out of all these things. Worship in Jesus. I can help you with that. We're going to help you with it right now. I can help you with that. Coming together in fellowship. I can, I can help you with that. We have groups that meet all over the place. Most of you aren't in them, but you should be. You're missing out. We fellowship together in the lobby. We create ways to do that all the time. I can help you with that. I can help you to give sacrificially. We pass buckets around all the time. We put the need in front of you. Special projects pop up like the youth room, and we don't even ask for your money. Just come and hang, hang, hit a nail. Do something, right? We give you opportunities. I can help you give sacrificially. I can help you be rooted in the Word. I can help you be rooted in the Word. I will preach to you the way that the Word is rooting in me. I can help you. But I can't help you with number three. I can't help you confess and repent. I can't help you do that. Do you know that? Stand to your feet for me, please. I can't help you confess and repent. I cannot help you do this. Next week, God will bring his people here. Adam, how do you know that? Because I asked him to. Because we petitioned him to. Because we begged him to. Because he always has. Every time we've built anything, a new kids' room, a new youth room, a new auditorium, a new anything, and that's been like 15 times in the life of this church in four years, every single time he has filled it up with people. Almost the following week. We just built a youth room that was way more than we needed to handle the kids that we have at Union. What did he do the first week? Slap, filled it to the brim. Because he brings the increase. Next week, he's going to bring people. And you know what? His people need to be ready. And when I say that, I don't mean ready through having signs and carpets cleaned and programmatically speaking and kids ministry ready and coffee and cookies and parking lot spaces. I, I mean, we're going to do that because we're going to give God all we got. But that's not what I mean, be ready. I mean, you need to be ready in here. We need to be ready in our hearts. And how we get ready in our hearts is we drop the bomb of repentance on the sin that is in our lives. I want to invite you today. We're going to sing one of the most powerful worship songs that I know. We're going to declare that he is our rescuer. That he came to rescue us. And I want to push you to get out of your worried about what people are thinking. Push back on whoever's in your row. And come down to this altar. Adam, it's not an altar, it's a stage. An altar is where God is. He is right here. Believe me, you wouldn't have heard anything good today if God wasn't filtering it out. He's right here in this room. And I want to push you to come down here and confess and repent. I can't help you with that. Confess and repent. You know what it is. You come down and you lay it on the altar in confession. And then as you repent, you're going to actually walk away from it back to your seats. It's an act of repentance. Those of you that don't know Christ as your Savior you come forward you confess that you're not my savior I can't save me will you save me I repent of my sin and you don't walk back to your seat by yourself you walk back to your seat being saved and redeemed as a child of Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit sitting inside your chest I want you to come and confess and repent this morning I want us to be ready for what God's gonna do in this city that is his in this church that is his Lord God, we, we pray to you right now, Father, I'm, I would just ask that you move in people's hearts, God, that you would stir in their souls, that you would just move, Lord. Where, where else can we go, God? Nowhere. Lord, we desperately lay down at your altar today the ways in which we've been Christless Christians. Lord, move in this church. We need you. We need you to rescue us. Always, over and over again, Father. 
Lord, I pray that you'd move in the hearts and souls of men and women in this church today. That they would confess and repent to you. We drop the bomb. We drop the, the warhead on sin in our lives. We love you, God. We prepare our hearts for you. In Jesus' name, amen.